Good morning. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. I was just waiting for a you know enthusiastic response. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter one. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, we do have a stack of Bibles on the table in the back. Please feel free to grab one of those. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to make that our gift to you. Philippians chapter 1. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the joy of being alive. We thank you, Father, for sustaining us this morning by giving us lungs to breathe with eyes to see with, ears to hear, mouths to speak, as well as to bless and encourage others. Father, this morning we come eager to hear from you. So Father, I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes this morning to see wonderful things from your word. Pray that you would incline our hearts to you, not to be prideful or any false mode of God. I pray, Lord, that you would unite our hearts to fear your name and that you would satisfy us, Lord, with your steadfast love. Help us this morning, Father, to taste and see that you are good. And Father, I pray that you would stir up our affections for you. Equip us to be who you've called us and declared us to be. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please read with me from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. This is God's holy and authoritative word. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May God bless the preaching and the hearing of his word this morning. Well, have you ever sat in a prayer meeting and prayed next to someone who Uh, Their prayer was just filled with a vigor and an insight and a depth and a richness of knowledge and a passion and a fervor that made you want to pray more like them, that, that made you think, I want to sit here and just listen to this person pray because their prayers are stoking my faith. Their prayers are making me want to know God more like this person knows God. Have you ever prayed with someone like that? I have. I've prayed with a lot of people like that. I do it every week with saints that meet in the prayer meeting uh, and that pray. And I just think, God, help me to pray like these individuals. Well, this morning, we get to listen in to a prayer meeting where the Apostle Paul himself is praying for the church. And there, there are a few people that you could point to and say, this person has a greater depth of insight and knowledge and affection for the Savior than Paul, who wrote so much of the Bible, right? So we get to hear how Paul prays for this church, prays for this church that he loves, and he wants good things for this church. He wants the best things for this church, and that is what fills his prayer for them. But this isn't simply Paul's burden for the church at Philippi. Now, this is a divinely inspired prayer. God inspired Paul to pray this prayer. And what God inspires Paul to pray for is what God wants for his church. It's what God wants for this church. And that means that this prayer, prayed nearly 2,000 years ago, is relevant for us today. The focus of his prayer for the church is love. This is an accent on the priority of love. Love, as you know, is the supreme Christian virtue. It is written about throughout the Bible. When when asked uh, what was the greatest commandment, love love for God and love for others is what Jesus responded. Paul has written much of love throughout all of his letters. Love is what binds every other virtue together in perfect harmony. So every other virtue in the life of the believer has its manifestation in love. Love is what binds us together. Without love, there is no unity in the church. Without love, uh, we have no fellowship. Apart from love, there is simply no life that we have together whatsoever. 
So, of course, when Paul prays for this church, whom he loves, he prays for their love. And so this is what I want us to look at this morning. This very simple hope, this very clear priority from the Apostle Paul about what should be our highest priority, the call to abound in love. That is my desire for this church, and that is what Paul prayed for the church at Philippi, that we might want for ourselves to abound in love. So here's the Apostle Paul, Paul the Apostle, who wrote, writes these great theological trees, but he doesn't start off his letter with some great theological insight. He doesn't start off addressing morality. He simply says, what I want for you, what I hope for you, what I want God to do in this place is not only to let you love, but to let your love abound, which means he doesn't simply want the church at Philippi to know a little bit about love, but for them to have a type of love which is infectious and growing and growing and abounding. That's the type of love that he calls us to. And so it is this desire of Paul's heart for the church at Philippi. And therefore, I believe God's desire for you and I this morning, that our love might not be a stagnant love, but it might be a love that abounds, a love that overflows. And although that sounds simple, Paul does make it a little bit more complex because he qualifies that. He says, listen, I want you to abound in love. And the reason that I want you to abound in love is because your ability to do so and your ability to grow in love and watch love increase and overflow out of you will be directly linked to your relationship with God. He says, you cannot simply decide to love. Now, I know in saying that, I'm going in the opposite direction of those who say that love is a verb, that love is a choice, that it is something you do. And I'm well aware of that, but I want you to hear me here because this is, the, this is talking about a very powerful stirring in our heart, a stirring in the human being, not just in our heart, but in our soul, but in everything that a human is that says, I love. I love. And what happens is that somehow, and this is where we get divine mystery, Right? is that somehow we find ourselves under the waterfall of God's love. And it washes away uncleanness. And it, and it soothes battered souls. And it heals wounds. And it feels so good that you just don't want to get out of it. Amen. You imagine that. You feel that. And it overflows our hearts in such a way that we can't help but start to love others. It, it overwhelms us even those we could never fathom that we could love, even those we could never expect that we might love, even those that come to mind right now that you just think, how could I ever love that person? But listen, human love, human love can never terminate on itself. It, it, it simply cannot receive all of this love from the Lord and, and just let it sit there and just think, oh, God loves me, God loves me. Oh, look at that terrible person over there. Look at that terrible sinner Oh my goodness, if God's love pours into you and you sit under that waterfall and you just receive from the Lord, have you ever watched a waterfall and you see it pouring into a stream and it's just dumping with volume and with weight and it's, and it's coming down and it doesn't just kind of land there and stay there, does it? It splashes and it spills out over the banks and it washes up on the shore. It gets all around well, the love of God that abounds is the waterfall of God's affections for you and I. It affects us. It flows into us, and then it flows out of us. And if it doesn't flow out of us, then we've got a problem because if you've ever witnessed a waterfall that goes somewhere, you know that it doesn't just land there and stay put, but it goes places. It has to go somewhere. And so this morning, that's what I want us to look at. How does that happen? Paul is going to take this simple statement, and he's going to make it more complex because he doesn't want us to simply abound in love. He wants us to abound in the love that is from real knowledge. This is an informed love, all right? It's an informed love from real knowledge. So this is going to take away any kind of love that is based on you know, no knowledge, no understanding, but just, uh, I, I don't know, I love him. You know, this, this is what, uh, this is the kind, of, the kind of foolishness I'm talking about here is the, is the wife who is being abused by her husband, but is still convinced that, that he loves her. That is not a love that is based on real knowledge. So let me give you an example from this morning. So I, uh, I got home late last night, like a, like a number of other people in this room. My voice is scratchy this morning. I got home late, and I stayed up late because I has, still had a long way to go working on this message. 
And uh, <laughs> that's not a brilliant idea for a 40-year-old man uh, to stay up late like I was 20. I'm not 20. Sometimes I think I'm 20. I try to act like I'm 20. I realize, nope, I'm not. I'm old. <laughs> and so last night, I stayed up very late working on this message. And this morning, I got up early. I, I have to get up early because I have five sons and I have to get up before they do because if I wake up after they do, well, my house gets loud. It gets crazy loud, and there's no way I'm sitting down and having undistracted, unrushed fellowship with the Lord once my boys are awake. It's very, very tricky to do so. Uh, and so I got up early, and I looked, I turned to the book of Romans. I'm reading the book of Romans right now, and R Romans is this glorious book. It's like the Mount Everest of all books out there, and I, and I turned uh, to Ch Romans chapter 4, verse 8, and I don't want you to turn there but I want to read to you what I read from it this morning. Okay, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Just listen to this. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So I read that this morning. I'm sitting there at my desk, and I've got my curtains open, and, the, and I'm looking out. You know, my, my back window opens up to, to a field, and I see these birds flying around. And I just see this beautiful morning, and I'm drinking my coffee, and I'm reading this, and I'm thinking about what I just read. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And as I read that, my affections just begin to stir, and I just begin to sing in my heart and to be overwhelmed with the love of God and the mercy of God toward me, a sinner. And I started to wonder at his amazing grace and to realize how blessed I am because in Christ, the Lord does not count my sin against me. That is glorious. That is amazing Grace, I mean, I am a sinner, I am a screw-up, and I, I blow it all the time, every day. Ask any of the guys in my small group. Ask anyone who knows me, anybody who spends any time around me, and yet all God has for me is love and mercy. He looks at me as his beloved child, and he welcomes me. I've got you know, little boys who loved it to jump up on my lap. While I'm singing here this morning, one of my boys came and ran and, and jumped up on me. And, and I don't, you know, you cannot imagine rejecting him and saying, no, I will not embrace you. I love to do that. And, and how much more our infinite and eternal God that welcomes you and I to him. And that makes me love him. That makes me over, overflow in my affection for him. It makes me want to come in here this morning and just enjoy him. It makes me want to have Juan come back here, up here on the stage and just lead us in song after song after song, praising God. That's what I want to do this morning. I want to praise him because my love is informed by who he is. It's based upon real knowledge of what he has declared in this book to be true about himself and his posture towards you and me. That's love based upon knowledge. And so I want to urge you this morning to read. I want to urge you this morning to read the Bible, to read God-centered, God-saturated men and women who write about God. Find them and latch onto them and read everything that they have written. Read, read that bookstore back there. Listen, that bookstore is not something, we don't make any money on those books, so we're not peddling books back there. We want to put good resources into your hands that will stir your affections for the Lord God Almighty. That's what we're doing back there. So, so head back there today and, and barrage uh, Jason and Christy who are serving back there with questions, which books you want to serve my affections? All right, do that. Build a library of God-saturated books. Here's the thing. Find the books that stir your affections for the Lord, and that's different for different people. But let your love grow in knowledge. Read books that aren't primarily about you. Read books that are primarily about God. Let your love grow in knowledge. Listen, the more I get to know my wife, the more my love for her is genuine. The more I learn her faults, the more she learns about mine, the more I learn about her strengths, the more she learns about mine, the more this love is growing deeper, the thicker our foundation is getting, and the more that our love on this, uh, and the more we can build on this foundation, because it's a love based not simply, not primarily on her physical beauty, and she is beautiful, but it's based on a real knowledge of her heart and soul, who she is, who, who God has formed her and intended her to be. And that is what happens when your love is based on real knowledge. 
And some of us, some of us this morning, you know, if, if you think, you know, how are my affections, are my affections growing for the Lord? And you think, I, I don't think that they are. It may, it may be because you don't know that much about him firsthand. It may be because you're taking, you know, you're, you're basically second-handing it and hearing what other people say about the Lord. And you're just kind of taking that and, and riding on that. All right? It's like somebody telling you how amazing tacos are and your mouth starts to water and you think, oh man, that, that must be amazing. But you never actually take a bite yourself. You haven't read for yourself or thought for yourself or thought about the fact that we are blessed because God does not count our sins against us, against those who have put their confidence in Christ Jesus. Now you think about that for a couple of days. And here's what I want you to do is start, watch what starts moving in your soul. Read texts, like go home and read Galatians chapter two and chapter three, which say that God's love for you is based on the fact that you believed, not based on anything that you did but simply on the fact that you believed. And you watch what happens in your soul as you start contemplating that. Pull out your journal and write about that. Put on some music and sing about that and watch what happens to you. You start to want to be with him and talk with him and you want to walk with him. That is love based on knowledge. And that is what Paul is calling us to here. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I want your love to abound in knowledge. But he also wants it to abound in discernment. In discernment. Now, each of us has a different pathway. And one of the things that I do, I'm a, I'm a peculiar guy. I, I know I'm, I'm strange in various ways for a lot of, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one of the things I do, I think I've mentioned this before, is that I've always had this fascination with graveyards, with cemeteries. Um, <laughs> you laugh. It's okay. It's, I'm, I'm strange. I get it. Uh, I'll go down to the Sand Bass Cemetery, and I will walk through that graveyard, and I'll walk among gravestones where I look at and I read the things that are on there, and I see people who, who died that were my age. I see people who died younger than me. I see people, I see graves for, uh, you know, that have dates on them that show that my children have lived longer than this child did. And, and what that does in me is it stirs my heart and my passion for Jesus Christ because I remember that I am not immortal and I am going to die. And that puts me in a zeal to know God all the more. And so each of us has their own pathway. Maybe I may be the only one in here who walks the cemeteries. I know my wife doesn't like it because I tried it with her. That wasn't romantic. I get it. Put that. I, I, I stopped doing that because I'm growing in discernment. But here's what I want you to do is watch your life and pay attention to what are those things for you that stir your heart and that stir your affections for Christ Jesus? What are those things that push you into God and those things that, that feel like they tear you away? What are those things for you? Because everyone in here has a different pathway uh, that pushes you towards God. For some of you, it might be getting out in nature. For some of you, it might be uh, reading books. Others of you, it's sitting down with your Bible and your journal and writing in response to God. For some of you, it might be music. Uh, now, when I start to sing, you better hope that there's something louder than I am around me because it's, it could be distracting. My, my noise is joyful, but it's not necessarily pleasant. But for some of you, singing and making melody in your heart, making music to the Lord, and, and you play instruments and you write songs, and that is beautiful. I, I have this, uh, this tradition that... Uh, uh, for my sons that when they turn nine years old, uh, I take them out on a special trip. So what we do is I get a series of gifts uh, for my son on his ninth birthday. And I take him out just one-on-one, -on -one, just, just he and I, and we'll go away. We'll go, uh, we'll go camp. We'll go backpack. We might do some climbing. We might do some, some fishing or something like that. But, but the point of this trip, you know, as much as it's is, is this cool moment where I can be alone with one of my sons and give him undistracted attention, which again is, is difficult in our house, um, we go away, and, and I have these gifts, and I give them, the, the climax of these gifts is a Bible and a journal, and I give them the Bible and the journal, and we sit down on this multi-day camping trip, and we, and we talk about just sitting quietly before the Lord, and we, we read together. We, he'll go and read, and I'll go and read, and then I'll talk to him about how to journal in response to God, writing something about God, writing something about themselves, some some area of application or whatever it is. 
And, and the funny thing is that I, I think I'm just creating little you know, mini errands, which is dangerous. You know, and I, I know many of you have warned me against that uh, for good reason. But here's, what, here's the strange thing that's happened is that both of my sons who are older than nine now uh, have come to me and have basically asked if they, can, if they can do something a little bit different, if they can take that idea and, and tweak it a bit. And so one of my sons, what he likes to do is he likes to write songs. So he takes his Bible reading, he'll sit down with his Bible and he'll read and he'll respond by writing songs in response to what he's you know, read that morning in his Bible. Now, where did that come from? That didn't come, that's my son, that's my boy. I mean, that, that is, I'm not wired that way at all. But there you go, that's my son, that's his pathway from, my, from one of my other sons. It's drawing, it's writing, it's making art in response to God. And so the, the point here is that everybody has different pathways. God's wired all of us differently. For a lot of us, it's, it's going to be similar things. Maybe, you know, if, if, if I've got fellow cemetery walkers, raise your hands, come find me after the service, let me know, and we'll, and we'll hang out together, okay? Um, you know, for some of you, it's art, but whatever it is, what is your pathway? What are those things for you that stir your affections for the Lord Jesus Christ? And what are those things that tear you away? You want to pay attention to those things. What are those things? For me, it's too much TV. For me, it's, it's too much, you know, lots of things. You know, I can have an addictive personality. So I have to be very careful with what I give time to. Because I notice that when I just, you know, you guys all give me a hard time about the Cowboys. When I pay too much attention to how they're doing, I, I, I just, I just, I spend less time in the Word. I spend less time, you know, uh, doing the things that God calls me to do, doing the things that are really good for me and that really endure. So pay attention. What are those things in your life that stir your affections? What are those things that rob your affections? If you're doing some things, you know some things in your life, that when you're a part of them and when you're doing them, you feel like someone just threw you into the presence of God. Keep doing that. Keep doing those things. So Paul's prayer is that love would abound more and more with knowledge of him and in discernment. And here's the thing, I don't want you to simply uh, nod your head and agree with me this morning. I do want you to agree with me this morning, but I want you to leave this morning not simply agreeing, but I want you to go out contemplating and meditating. I want you to leave here wondering, where, Lord, is that in my life? Where can I grow in knowledge? Where can I grow in discernment? Where can I grow in letting my love abound? I want you to meditate on these truths of God for yourself. I want, to, I want you to have conversations like I had with this. Uh, I had a, guy, a conversation with a guy at the coffee shop yesterday. Uh, I, was, I was there in the morning preparing for the wedding, and, uh, and this, this guy that works there, uh, I don't know him super well, but I've been getting to know him, and I asked him, hey, how you doing? Because I'm in Texas, that's what you do, is you say, how you doing? You don't expect a, a meaningful interaction necessarily, but, it, but it's a sincere, you know. Uh, and, and he responded by saying, you know, I've, I've really been wrestling lately with the love of God. I was like, oh, wow, we're going deep. Okay. <laughs> I expect to like, fine, great. How are you? Um, that's, that's normally what I get. But, but instead, he says, I've been wrestling with the love of God in my life. I was like, oh, really? okay. Well, why don't you elaborate on that? And so we start talking about that. And, and what that's done in this man's life is over the last months, as he's been wrestling that, that's driven him into a study of God's word and God's character. As he wrestles with that, as he contemplates that, I want us to wrestle with who God is. I want us to wrestle. I don't want us to, to be satisfied with just simple answers all the time, but to wrestle with who God is and what that means for our lives. I want us to leave here today asking, is my love abounding? Asking ourselves, are my affections growing? Considering whether we've been appropriately devoting ourselves to cultivating a knowledge of God that grows through his word. And are we growing in love for others? Look with me at verse 10. Paul says, It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. Now that, that word approve kind of threw me off when I first read it, because how do you approve something that God does? It's like I look at something that God does and I say, yep, I like that. That's good, God. Like God needs our affirmation of something. He needs our approval. But the word here simply means more, something more akin to endorse. So it's like an endorsement of something, to become a spokesman for things that are excellent. 
Now what happens as love begins to abound more and more in your life is you begin to shine brighter and brighter because you transcend the meanness and the evil in this world. And, and we're all affected by the meanness of this world, aren't we? We all feel it in various ways. <laughs> I mean, if, you, um, if it wasn't a sin, you got to like a question that starts like that, right? If it wasn't a sin and you could jump into a time machine and go back in time and punch someone in the face, who would it be? I mean, how many of us had somebody come right to mind? For some of us, it might be five or six of you. We'll talk later. <laughs> the reality is that we've all been hurt. We've all been stung. We've all been affected by the meanness of this world in various ways. And, you know, the thing is, when you, if you start to talk to somebody about this, if you, if you start to talk to them and draw them out about that, you'll see people start to get really angry because they get worked up. And, and many of us, you know, there's so many men and women that I've talked to over the years that we, we just replay various scenarios in our head over and over and over. And we dwell on that. We just think about that terrible thing. And, oh, man, I, I wish he'd try that again. I would pull out my pepper spray and, and spray him in the face. You ever do that? You ever think like that? You ever leave a conversation and have the right thing to say and say, oh, man, I, I hope he says something like that again because I'm going I'm to respond with a zinger. I'm going to put him in his place. Listen, it's a mean world, but, but when, despite the meanness all around us, despite the, the fallenness that surrounds us, despite the pain uh, and, and fallenness of mankind, we begin to shine like stars in the universe. We preach a better word than any sermon or any words ever could Amen. with our lives and the way that we respond. So how is your love for others? Do you find yourself harboring bitterness and resentment? Do you find yourself overly concerned with personal boundaries? What do we do with that? I think we give attention to our growing in knowledge of God and His love for us in Christ Jesus. We give priority to this gathering together right here of this church where we grow in our love for God together. We give priority to God's self-revelation, this book, as we study this book personally every day. Listen, our knowledge of God has a direct impact on our love for others. As we grow in our knowledge of God, we will grow in our love for God, and that in turn will lead us to growing in love for others. Knowledge of God empowers our love for others. The more that knowledge increases, the more our love will abound more and more like that waterfall that pours down, and it will just spill out through us. This is why I say that love is not simply an action or a verb or a decision. is because it's something that happens to us and that pours out of us. It's difficult to repress when you're experiencing the love of God in this way. Our love for others will flow from increasing knowledge and understanding of who God is and how amazing and liberating His love is for us. Now, this demands deep relationships within the church. We cannot be, be merely casually acquainted with, with one another and experience love the way that God intends. This requires time and attention and investment and effort. It takes work. In the context of this local church, it requires real participation in small group ministry. We need to ask, for the sake of love, do I know the people that I am called to love? Not simply, what do I get out of this meeting, but God, what have you called me to give to these others? How have you called me to love and serve? What person is coming to small group meeting this week that is carrying a burden that you are calling me to come alongside and help them with? We need to ask for the sake of love, am I invested in these relationships? Do I know people well enough around me to love them well? Or am I too busy? Remember, this prayer is God's will for his church. And he calls us to love, biblical love, which is utterly, radically others-centered, others-oriented. This is a love that's concerned. This is a love that's dialed in. This is a love that is attentive and a love that is sacrificial. Loving someone is much more than simply being kind to them. It is more than simply tolerating them when deep down inside you're really just annoyed by them. 
Watch out for that. Loving, biblical love is knowing how to love like Christ because we know Christ. It's having a depth of insight into the person that we're called to love so that we know what is best to them and that we can give that to them. Paul's going to go on in this letter in chapter 2 uh, to say, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Love looks to the interests of others, friends, and says what is in their best interests, and then gives that and works toward that and investigates until they know that. So Paul prays for our love to abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. This is all leading to the day of Christ, to the day of the return of our King. And this is the second time, pay attention, this is the second time in two verse, or in four verses, he mentions in verse 6, he mentions it again right here, that Paul mentions the return of Christ. What we're reminded of in this prayer is that we are a work in progress. We are under construction. We are not yet what we will be until the day of Christ. Christ's return shined a light on the life of Paul. His eschatology, his study of last things, his anticipation of the return of the king fuels all of his theology and all of his letters. It's, it's written throughout. So he's motivated, and he's motivating us to press on in love by looking to the return of Christ. And so we see what God's will is for our life. His will for our life, God's will for our life, is that we would grow in love every day from now until that day. That every day will be preparation for that day. That way of life includes abounding in love more and more every day. Is that how we think about our life? Is that how you think about your life? Is that how you think about your days? Is that how you think about your job, your work? You know, most of us are going to you know, go back to work tomorrow morning. Is that how you think about your time there, that you're investing and you're working and you look at those that are around you? Do you work in light of that day? I encourage you to do that. Every day is preparation for that day. That's how we should think about our life. This is what ought to inform our prayers. Every day is preparation for that day. And the way that we prepare for that day, the day of Christ, is by abounding in love. And so Paul gives us a vivid picture of what the church will look like on that day in verse 11. He says that we will be Filled with the fruit of righteousness. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. We'll be like trees laden with fruit. Have you ever seen a tree laden with fruit where the, the limbs are heavy and they're sagging and hanging low? From this day until that day, God is forming us until the, the character of Christ is heavy as his love forms in us that it just spills out all around us. God is forming his church, this church, into a community of believers, brothers and sisters, who will be so filled with love that on that day, we will be pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness, so that we will accurately reflect the beauty and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is his will for us, is shaping in us Christ-like people. And at this point, I don't want us to be overwhelmed with this prayer. Paul prays a simple prayer, but it's also filled with complexity. But thank God that Paul concludes his prayer by turning his attention away from our responsibility to obey. And he ends by drawing our attention to the source of our obedience and our growth. This entire prayer is only possible through Jesus Christ. That is the point of verse 11. This love and this fruit are not possible through human effort alone, but only by the grace of God that empowers our effort. And you know, that is not a contradiction. Our obedience and God's grace is not a contradiction. 
Paul is going to make this point masterfully later on in this book when he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How? Why? Because God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we could say, abound in love more and more for, not so that, but for, this is the ground of our work. This is the ground of our effort to abound in love, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's how we abound in love. So no need to be overwhelmed. God is at work in our lives. God is never not at work in the lives of those he loves. He's at work in your life this morning. He's at work in the lives of his children. He's at work bringing about his good pleasure and his good will. And we know what his will is for us. It is to abound in love. This will be realized in our life because Christ, Christ who began a good work in us, he will bring it to completion. That is the promise that he said just a few verses earlier in verse 6. That is a certainty. Bank on that. Rest in that. I love how, how Bart preached it a couple weeks ago that God does not have a closet full of half-finished projects. Many of us will start a project and we'll leave it half complete and we'll, we'll put it in the garage, we'll put it in the attic, and we leave it alone. God doesn't do that. God completes what he began every single time. And so we can pray with faith for this church, for ourselves, just like Paul prayed for the Philippian church. We can pray believing that God will cause our love to abound more and more as we get to know him and his love for us more and more. And as we get to know those he has called us to, as those he has placed around us, as we get to know them, so that we will best know how to love one another with pure motives and blameless service that is filled with the fruit of godly love. That is our aim all through Jesus Christ. And so the last phrase of this prayer, look with me, the last phrase of this prayer to the glory and praise of God. This is the highest purpose of our lives, brothers and sisters. This fills our lives every day with purpose. Even the most mundane days where you're just clocking in and clocking out and it's the same old, same old. This gives our lives purpose to abound in love through Christ for the glory of God. That is my purpose in life. That is your purpose in life. That is what God has called us to be and called us to do, is to live for his glory, to abound in love through Christ for the glory and praise of God. That's what this church is all about. That is what our individual lives are about. That is God's will for you and me. And that is why Paul prays at the outset of his letter to the Philippian church, that we would abound in love through Christ for the glory and praise of God. And the, le the rest of this letter is unfolding how we do that. That's his prayer for you and me. So we can pray this prayer with confidence, knowing that God is eager to answer. Please join me in prayer. Father, this morning we, <laughs> we want to be mesmerized by your love. As we started out singing, Father, we want to leave here singing in our hearts. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sins. We want to be amazed and astonished by your grace. We want to... Never take for granted the glorious privilege that it is to be called children of God. Father, people like me who screw up every day, that fall short, you know us, Lord. We, we can think, oh man, if, if people knew me, they, they might not like me. But God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know all of the things that happen you know, in, in secret places and, and all the thoughts we've had, God. And Lord, you have cleansed us by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sacrificial lamb. 
And so, Father, we praise you for that this morning. And we pray, God, that you would stir up in us those affections, God. Help us, Lord, to look up and to see our Father who loves us, who welcomes us. And let that undo us, Lord. Let that stir our affections for you until it overflows us. Until it overwhelms us, Lord, that is infectious, not stagnant, Father, but that it's infectious love that abounds more and more, informed by who you are. And God, help us to love others the way that you've called us to. Help us to love them in knowledge and insight and discernment, Lord, knowing how to best serve them. God, I pray that you would keep our motives pure that you would kill envy and rivalry and self-promotion. Help us, Lord, to be interested in what best serves our brothers and sisters in this room and in this community, in this world. Help us, Lord, to be outposts of a world to come. Let our lives display the beauty and the majesty and the glory of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Empower us by your Holy Spirit toward that end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.